biologist, okay? Uh, he is actually a scientist that plays with data. Um, computational biology is, is, is a very interesting area. Not, maybe not everybody's cup of tea, but they're doing some very interesting things with it. Uh, now that we've got the computational power of unlocking the human genome um, and lots of other in, very interesting biological information, uh, but it's, it's difficult. We're dealing with massive amounts of data. And, well, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how to put it, but, but the computational biology space is, is doing some tremendous stuff with big data. And Chris is going to be talking about some cutting edge stuff, and I'll let him explain exactly what he's going to talk about once he gets all plugged in here. So we go HDMI. Okay. Hi. Yes. All right. So, I'll let Chris take it over here. Okay. So, um, I think half the room just left to go to the lunchroom, but that's okay. You might be going to the bathroom. Beer, beers and long conversations. <laughs> yes. So, um, I will say a few things about uh, myself first, since they're not really important. Uh, I'm not talking about me, but this busy slide is just a representation of my busy career. So, uh, I've been doing computational work since uh, about 30 years ago. Um, developed uh, PC software in the 80s and sold it. Um, uh, that was before I did my PhD in biochemistry, and then uh, so I, I really am a scientist, and I wasn't trained in what we call bioinformatics today because it didn't exist. There were no programs in bioinformatics. So, in, uh, in about 1997, I started uh, a laboratory uh, after my postdoc at uh, the Genome Center at NCBI. Um, I began in uh, Toronto uh, a laboratory which I ran for about 10 years, which grew to about 80 people. Uh, 20 of which were uh, software developers, another 40 were database curators. Uh, we developed uh, one of the first uh, databases of interactions of how parts inside cells assemble together. Uh, and there were lots of um, hard data problems back then, and that was uh, before 2005. So I, I go back and I've done a lot of stuff, but again, this isn't about me. Um, one of the uh, kind of algorithm things that we had to chew through back in 2002, which I'll throw out, is, uh, is just the, uh, the problem of n by n comparisons. You have a data set and you want to cluster things. And, and I think uh, this, this uh, actually is well led in by the previous talk, because in, in fashion you have to find things that are similar. Uh, we were working with Sequence in uh, 2002, and uh, we had to compare uh, an n by n database of uh, about uh, 85 million protein sequences um, and do the uh, upper triangle. One of the cool things with the upper triangle is you can actually load balance um, uh, jobs by running the long part of one triangle and the small part of another triangle on the same run. So if you've got a database uh, run that goes loads the database in memory and does comparisons, um, you can query this part of the triangle and this part of the triangle sort of, uh, across these diagonals at the same time to balance. So stuff like that um, helped us figure out how to do this on the hardware that we had at the time in 2002. Um, and this, uh, this type of algorithm was, uh, was what we were working on. That's a, a cluster of, um, uh, I think those are 200 megahertz uh, dual processor Linux machines uh, from VA Linux, which now still holds um, source large. Um, another um, thing that we ran at the same time on that cluster when we weren't computing pairwise um, sequence uh, relationships, we were looking at um, sampling random structures of proteins to try to sort out um, some of the outliers that, uh, that actually fold. And um, this led to a, a three-tiered architecture with um, load balancers, um, data collection points, uh, which were uh, trying to you know, uh, cache information that was going into an IBM DB2 database on an HP uh, PA risk machine, um, and this thing, um, <laughs> this, is, this is the fire hazard of about 6,000 computers that people were running in distributed computing. So back in the time, um, we had a, a, a screensaver version. Actually, people, you can see there's no screens on those, so they weren't running the screensaver version. They were running the, the hardcore command line version. But people would uh, donate their compute times, form clubs, and race 
to get points. So we build this infrastructure to, uh, to oh, sample proteins. And uh, those are some of the screenshots that people posted on the forums of the rigs that they built on plywood, the fire hazards in their basement, <laughs> that, that were our cloud. And uh, so, uh, you know, but those didn't cost me anything, and I just needed to provide the bandwidth to get the, uh, the sampling data back from them. The, the analytics were actually run on their machines. We didn't create the simulation data and send it back home to do the analytics on. So the simulation data was run on the cores, uh, it was evaluated in memory, and then only the results that scored in the top 100 were actually pushed onto their disk and then pushed back into our servers. So this is fairly sophisticated archi architecture for the time, and um, one graduate student did this. Which country is this? Which, which state? Toronto, Canada. So electricity must be cheaper. I'm sorry? Electricity must be cheap. Uh, the volunteers paid for the power. Yeah. yeah. So it's free. So for me, I, I, I got I got six thousand one gigahertz CPUs around the world for free. This was this was the age of distributed computing. So so that was two thousand three. That was big data back then. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about is something that was just released on the twenty sixth of June, um, which is Manta. And Manta is a new operating system level component of, uh, of an infrastructure as a service uh, platform that's run by Joint. So um, it's at the base level, it's an object store system. But what you can do with it is map reduce any Unix command on the object store without moving the data. And I'm going to break this down and, and show you how this is done. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental game changer for people who want to run large-scale Unix commands without pushing everything into a Hadoop framework. It's just Unix. So how do you get uh, a phase change like this into an operating system? Well, Mant is built on something called SmartOS. SmartOS is built using something called the Illumos kernel. Does anybody, has anybody heard of the Illumos? What was the light? Yes. You got it. So, so SmartOS is not GNU Linux. It's a Unix kernel that is grandfathered from the Open Solaris project. And I'll, I'll explain this in, in the next slide. Um, it's a very, SmartOS is designed as a very lightweight Illumos distro running on cloud hypervisors. So you boot it on a USB stick or over a PXE environment. Um, and the operating system stays in memory, and doesn't leave a footprint on the disk. So if you want to power up a rack of machines, you PXE boot them. If you want to change the operating system, you reboot them. There's no operating system footprint stored on the disks. So yes, this is derived from uh, Sun Microsystems Open Solaris, and currently the number of uh, Unix and uh, GNU packages are uh, number over 10,000 via the package source system. So most of the software that's out there um, is running. So this is, this is kind of the, the, the historical view of um, how Illumos came to be. Um, but it, uh, it is derived from uh, back in the 80s and 90s, the Unix System 5 Release 4, which uh, Sun Microsystems pushed into Solaris in 1992. And after four years of uh, brutal legal work, they were able to actually get this into open source and in 2008, Open Solaris was born, uh, but at this time, Linux had already pretty much taken over everything, so um, almost nobody noticed. And um, Sun didn't do so well, even though they had released some very cool technology. Um, and in January 2010, they were bought up by Oracle. And um, Oracle proceeded to close down Open Solaris and stop releasing source code and effectively turned off the tap. Uh, at that time, uh, a large contingent of uh, Solaris engineers uh, left Sun and started joining other companies. Um, that, those include Joint, uh, OmniOS, Delphix, DY Systems, and Nixenta. And they started collaborating on something which is called the Illumos kernel, which is a fork of Open Solaris. 
And that was allowed to happen because of the structure of the open source copyleft license, the CDDL, or Cuddle license. So what's happened since 2010, August 2010, with the release of this um, fork uh, of Illumos, this group of companies and contributors to the kernel have put in uh, a number of innovations, just, just first off, getting it to work. Um, doing the, the internationalization code that uh, wasn't open source, that had to be done. Uh, getting it to work off of GCC tools for compiling, because the, this Solaris Studio compiler wasn't open sourced in the process. Um, they added things like ZFS feature flags, which allowed this file system to, uh, to have modifications based on use cases. Um, Simple things like background delete. When I started using SmartOS and, and Illumos uh, in 2011, um, this was a problem when you were having a large number of files, and I would load up 600,000 files into a directory and wait for two hours for it just to run delete and give me a command prompt back. So, so uh, essential things for, for dealing with uh, large data sets uh, have, been, have been fixed. Um, uh, last year, uh, LZ4 compression, which is a, a very high-performing compression. It can detect something that's already compressed and bypass it. Um, that is built into ZFS in the Illumos uh, community. Oracle doesn't have it. Okay, So because Oracle doesn't release their source, they can't take the Illumos innovations back in. And I can tell you, this list of Illumos um, features is a lot longer than, than Oracle's. And the sort of the, the crowning achievement here is actually putting KVM, uh, the hypervisor, into Illumos. So uh, SmartOS is built as a very lightweight hypervisor uh, driver, uh, running both Solaris zones, which are, if you're familiar with virtual machines, a zone is a virtual machine of the same operating system um, running um, without another extra layer of device drivers. So if you run Linux on top of Windows in, in a virtual machine and you're sending packets from code running a runtime in the Linux kernel, it's got to go through the Linux virtual device drivers and then through the Windows virtual device drivers and out of the system. A Solaris zone, the virtual machine uses, has direct access to the stack of the kernel. So those packets don't go through the extra layer. Okay, so the performance of a, of a Solaris zone as a virtual machine itself is remarkably fast. And the boot time and the, and the, uh, the time to start up is, is near instantaneous. So if you want to start up a zone as a virtual machine in Solaris, it's on. So these features have uh, propagated and, and the uh, kernel developers, um, they, they check each other's code. Uh, that goes back into the Illumos kernel. So it's, uh, it's similar in, uh, in the um, organizational framework to uh, to what goes on in Linux. It's a much smaller um, uh, circle of developers, but uh, most of them have an incredible amount of experience on the operating system. So this is um, enterprise-ready stuff. I mean, ZFS is, uh, it has been around for over a decade now, and um, you know, a lot of the other technology, like D-Trace, that allows you to uh, look in and uh, see what's going on at the performance level of compiled code, see what files it's writing, see how fast it's writing them. You can look at the hard disk latency. A lot of the performance monitoring tools are completely unsurpassed in this environment. So that's what SmartOS is, um, and this, this just reiterates it on text, but um, if, you, if you're interested in looking at these distributions, um, SmartOS, um, as I said, is a very thin hypervisor. If you want to run it on a, on a machine, I would suggest uh, uh, OmniOS is more like a like a CentOS server distribution. Open Indiana is uh, is kind of a, uh, tried to be everything that Solaris was for e even laptops, but it, that has sort of been abandoned. And Exenta Store is uh, is a file system for um, uh, attached storage and software defined storage. So the uh, the pre prerequisite for Manta use is getting something to run on Illumos, and I'll, hopefully. I'll show you why you might actually want to do that. So Joint, um, a little bit about Joint, they started in 2004. They've been doing hosting and cloud computing for as long or slightly longer than Amazon. Um, their hosting uh, currently um, is inter um, infrastructure as a service. They, um, they allow uh, Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, KVM images to be provisioned. Um, they support uh, 
and, and host LinkedIn. So you remember the first slide that in 60 seconds, 100 new LinkedIn accounts every second? Those are going to joints, data centers. Um, Wanalo is another uh, uh, fashion retail uh, service, Storifies on, on Joint, Geeklist, Tripshare, and Voxer, which is a push-to-talk uh, voice messaging system, which has a lot of uh, real-time data uh, requirements. The four primary data centers um, in the US and Europe, uh, and they also uh, license their whole data center infrastructure, and the notable ones that uh, that are running joint powered clouds are Telefonica in Spain, MyCloud in Taiwan, and Libero in Italy, and there are, there are others. And uh, recently in May 2013, Dell um, uh, announced that it was going to drop its OpenStack cloud and instead uh, push um, partners that, uh, that had already operated services, and joint uh, was one selected for its high performance, high availability features. So as an infrastructure as a service provider, um, Joint has full control of the development stack from the disk all the way to the network. It's the corporate steward of the Node.js um, JavaScript runtime, which incorporates the, uh, the V8 engine as the interpreter, which is from the Chrome project in Google. Um, I find it to be very community friendly. Uh, by the way, I don't work for Joint, just in case you're curious. Um, they're very community friendly. I'm one of the community people. Um, they provide smart OS image downloads, source for free, and support. You can ask them questions. They get back to you really, really quickly. And uh, you can, uh, as I'll show you on the last slide, deploy a private cloud for free with third-party management software, something called Project FIFO. So if you're interested in doing that in-house, um, it's, it's pretty cool. The storage implementation that Manta is built on is ZFS. I'm not, I'm not actually going to go through this slide, but um, uh, very much like uh, um, our, our first speaker said, it's, it's collapsing down and getting rid of um, the SAN and the NAS heads and actually um, consolidating things into virtual machines and, and JBODs. So for the sake of time, um, the ZFS Wikipedia entry um, is, is quite good for following up if you don't know what ZFS is. So what's Manta? Um, it's a multi-data center object store. fine grain replication commands. No object size limits. Per object replication policies. Uh, if you want two copies, if you want six copies. Um, a file system like namespace including directories. So it's not just a bucket, but you have a directory hierarchy to access. Up to one million files per directory. It has public folders for uh, content delivery type data delivery. Um, there is read after write consistency if you upload data. It's available as soon as the last bit hits the disk. You don't have to wait for it to sync. Um, they provided something called snap links, which is a form of a Unix link command. Uh, which is um, kind of a mashup between a link and a snapshot, which allows um, one to appear to move data without actually moving data. It's accessible via a REST or JSON API, but also interactively, as I'll show you shortly. And uh, the big feature is the compute on place, um, with MapReduce processing, running arbitrary Unix code and scripts without moving data. Uh, last thing is guard time uh, is a keyless infrastructure which um, uh, assigns a, a numeric code to information that um, uh, provides you with validation that uh, it hasn't changed since you put it there. So the compute on storage uh, philosophy is uh, it's actually something that Apistry um, first did and I, I actually wrote about that in my blog. If you got the newsletter, there's a link to my blog on that. It's smartos.blueprint.org. But um, the Manta version of compute on storage, which is moving the computation to storage, which is something I did back in 2003. I was trying to get my analytics to be run on those, those fire hazards in the basement. <laughs> okay? I want, I want that stuff to be done where the data is instead of move the data. So if you're, if you're running something on, and you've got data stored on E3, you've got to move the data into EC2 or Hadoop, 
and then orchestrate a method to run a query, and then clean up the data and get rid of the instances. On Manta, if you want to uh, run a simple thing like a grep test type test query, you can run grep on top of the data. Um, and Manta hands your job output into a new folder, and you're done. Snapshot rollback, it's, uh, it's clean. So how does this work? As an end user, you sit down on your computer, you install a Node.js package, which has the Manta command and the Manta interactive shell. Um, Node.js is a very high performance uh, runtime for doing I.O. You're running that on your notebook or your server in your data center, and that's communicating via node-to-node -node connection processes back to the, uh, the data center. The local environment that you're actually um, interacting with or writing uh, REST API work on includes uh, a MANA interactive shell um, and this REST API, which can be called from uh, software development kits in not only Node, but Perl, um, Python, and Ruby at the moment. Um, I think I've set all of those other things up, but the, the hashed UID, so, so how does this work? So the jobs that you're running, so you want to run grub, are sent off to the Manta machine. It launches a smart OS zone. That runs the query on your data. That basically executes a grep command. Um, that zone launches with a, a unique identifier, which is a hash. And what you see after that's done is that you get a new directory, a subdirectory in your, in your object store with a hash code. And the output of that job is in that subdirectory. So the types of commands you could run on Manta include um, very basic Unix-like commands. They're all prepended with M in front of it, so they look like ls, uh, manta ls, manta put and manta get are kind of like FTP commands, but they're actually using Node.js IO to send data back and forth. So that's optimized. Uh, mjob is actually what starts up the compute job. Uh, and mjob, um, uh, I'll show you a bit more of, about how that works. mfind can walk a hierarchy of, uh, of files. Um, uh, find wildcards and actually pipe that into mjob. So if you need to specify the input for a job as a, as a huge list of files, that's what mfind does. Um, mlogin gives you the interactive session command, which pretty much looks like a bash uh, command system. Um, MLN is, uh, is like LN, the uh, symbolic link to make uh, snap links and a few other commands that are fairly self-explanatory. On the data side, um, you can run all of these client-side commands plus a few additional ones which are for um, uh, aggregation and uh, uh, Unix piping. So, the pattern is simple. mjob create from the client. Minus m is a map function. You put in the command that you want to map. That command has to exist inside the virtual machine that's going to be launched. Um, so if that command...